This episode of Spectre Sound Studios is brought to you by the Shredmonton Metal Festival and Conference. I'll see you there in Edmonton, Alberta from May 6th to the 8th. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to SMG Viewers Comments episode 38. Let's get right to it. Your content has really gone downhill. I miss the videos focused on teaching people stuff. There's really no content other than, look what I did today, watch my blog post. Dude, I hear you, and I'm sorry you feel that way. I've got a lot of tutorials I would like to do. It's just a matter of finding time. You know, when I'm running sessions, I've got bands in the studio and I'm tracking stuff uh, to demo gear and that kind of stuff. I don't quite have a lot of time on top of that to do tutorials. I do have a bunch of stuff I want to do. There's a guitar miking one I'm working on right now, and I still, plan on doing how to mix heavy drums. That should be a two or three parter. I'm just trying to figure out a way how to make that not boring. And that's the tricky part uh, because it can be a little dry at times. If you guys want to see a tutorial on a subject that I haven't covered yet, please leave a suggestion in the comments below. If it's within my power, I'll make it happen. Just now seeing this. Thank you, Glenn. I almost had to choke someone I am no longer friends with. Glad you got some enjoyment out of it. Uh, please do not choke your friend. I can't say I'm particularly a fan of violence. Have you ever had a musician in your studio who brought a very expensive guitar or bass, but the tone was, to put it nicely, unsatisfying? Then they brought a much cheaper instrument and it sounded much better in the mix than the high-end one? Funny you ask that. As a matter of fact, I have had a situation similar to that happen in the studio. Uh, I was working with a, uh, a band a few years back and the guy had a very nice American Fender jazz bass that wasn't bad, but um, he wanted, we wound up using this, which is a $200 uh, Mexican Fender Jazz I picked up on local classifieds that I kind of cleaned up and um, made play a whole lot nicer. And the guy in the band wound up liking this more. Uh, the tone was better, the action was better. So hey, you know, price doesn't always mean quality. And just go with whatever instrument works best for whatever particular song you're working on. That's my rule of thumb anyway. Do you record with a snare bottom mic? Yes, I always put a bottom mic on, under my snare, usually an Audix i5 these days. And um, whether or not I use it in a mix really depends. It's pretty papery sounding, and I'm really enjoying the snare sound I'm getting with the dual mics on top of the snare, the 57 and the Studio Project C4. I can bring in a bottom snare mic again. I don't think it's adding much at this point, but it's a good safety net. If you've got a couple extra channels and you got an extra mic kicking around, throw it up. You know, it might just save your ass one day. Have you got any tips on working with symphonic metal, folk metal, prog, and other genres with tons of elements besides the usual guitar, bass, and drums? Is it just trial and error to see what works, or do you have some kind of methodology to make exotic elements fit nicely and keep the mix uncluttered? Oh, fuck. Now that's an interesting question. Uh, boy, you just pretty much described every uh, mix I've done for Protocol. Um, it's always a challenge uh, because they tend to try and jam as many instruments as possible into a mix and I'm kind of left scratching my head. Okay, well, what's the priority here? That's the thing about mixing. You can only jam so much into two channels, you know, so you've got it. It's definitely a, a bit of give and take. So there's definitely some trial and error, you know, guitars take up a lot of the mid range. And, you know, if you want to hear those other elements, you have to turn other things down to make room. That's there's just no other way around it. Uh, it really depends on what your priorities are and where you think the music should go. Um, I like working with some of the stuff because they bring in some pretty weird instruments from time to time. And it's kind of fun miking this stuff up. And it's a little bit challenging from an engineering standpoint. So that makes it that makes it pretty cool. So yeah, uh, bring on the folk metal. Hey Glenn, huge fan here. Do you recommend that bands spend the additional money to record the tape or is the money best spent on other areas of the record? Rock on. Well, it's not really a question of uh, expense at this point. I'd say, can your band actually play to tape? That's the bigger question because tape doesn't lie and there is no undo button. You have to play it correctly. Sure, you can transfer into digital and then manipulate it after the fact and then mix on digital, but you kind of be losing the point of recording to tape to begin with. That, that's my opinion anyway. So yeah, if you're, if you're gonna play to tape, you better bring your fucking A game. And yeah, it is more expensive too, obviously. So there's uh, there's a lot of things to consider before committing to recording tape. If you are gonna do something like that, if you're very curious, uh, I wouldn't recommend starting with an album. I'd say start with a single and just see how you like the process because it will definitely force you to work in a very different way. 
Hey guys, just wanted to let you know, I've got a spring t-shirt sale going on right now. I've marked down prices on all of my shirts, including the brand new Stop Cupping the Mic Dumbass shirt by Jason Rains, as well as the rule number two shirt. I've also got all my other shirts marked down and those are priced to clear. So if you want to get yourself a really cool shirt that your band members probably won't like very much, now's the time. Hey Glenn, I love your brutal honesty. I also love how you seem to drive out the worst of the crowd in droves. They always show up out of the woodwork to bleed all over these comments. I love how they can't help but turn out and display their shame for all of us to laugh at every time. It's almost like they feel some need to admit how pathetic they are. It's like self-help for them. Thankfully, we have you here to provide the help they need to be less shitty. You're doing crumbs work, sir. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was Mark Twain who said people would rather hear comforting lies than a harsh truth, but I just can't sit here and lie to you guys. Hey Glenn, if someone wanted to start learning how to be an engineer, what would you recommend as a good starting point? I'd recommend sitting right here on YouTube and going through some tutorials. There is a ton of great information out there. Not only myself, but I know Steven Slate has some amazing tutorials up on his YouTube channel and Fluff's got some great stuff. There is just tons and tons and tons of great information up here on YouTube. Unfortunately, you have to sift through a lot of crap to get through the really good stuff, but it is there. Start out with a Sapphire or something similar to that, just a two channel and start learning the basics of recording. Start with a nice, easy program like Reaper. That's what I use. It's not too expensive. And you know, you can get your feet wet for not a lot of money these days. And that's just fantastic. You know, the more, the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it and your skills will improve. Just remember, if you want to get truly good at something, you're going to need 10,000 hours at least. Why do you mic amps still? What advantage is there over just running the guitar to a direct box and straight to a recording computer with effects box and there are effects being done on the PC? Now this is an interesting question. I mean, like if you're in a younger generation coming up and you're used to seeing a lot of digital stuff, um, here's why, because you're gonna get a unique sound. The problem with amp sims, and there are a lot of good amp sims coming out these days, the reason I record real amps is for uniqueness because when you do use an amp sim, you're, you're, you're basically just getting a snapshot of what that amp sounds like with that particular mic in front of it at that particular spot. And when you're micing up a real amp, especially with something you know like a Dynamo, uh, you can really tweak the tone to something really unique and get a band something truly unique. I can take any of these amps here and run them through a different preamp if I want, and that's going to affect the sound. I can change up the mics, I can combine the mics, I can do all, all kinds of crazy configurations. I can blend cabinets. Yes, you can do that digitally as well, but you're not quite going to get the same signature. You're certainly not going to get um, a difference in tone, say a 57 into an API and then switch it up into a Vintec Dual 72. That's going to uh, color the sound in a very unique way. You're not gonna get with a, um, an amp sim. Basically, when I have paying clients in the studio, I'm not using an amp sim. I'm using the real thing with a real with a real cabinet because I still think that is a superior way to record. You know, if you don't have a major studio, that's a little different. If you're a kid in his bedroom, there's absolutely nothing wrong with using digital amp sims. Is the Windsor Hum real? And if so, does it affect recording? Yes, the Windsor Hum is a real thing. We actually had some scientists come down here a few years ago and, and they pinpointed the location uh, to Zug Island in Detroit. That's the epicenter of the Windsor Hum. Uh, just so happens it coincided with a certain American steel company starting up a blast furnace. So that has something to do with it as well. I've heard the Windsor hum uh, way out where I live, which is a good 20 miles away uh, from Zug Island at least. And I've heard it maybe once or twice and I actually did do a, a, a video on it a few years back. I mean, like this is still back when I was shooting my GH2 and I didn't quite have the elaborate setup I do today. So I just, I heard, I was downstairs and I was actually watching Apocalypse Now with my subwoofer on and you know, there's that B-52 strike and the whole fucking house is just rumbling and shit. And I'm like, okay, this is awesome. None of those and hold on a minute here. This rumble's not stopping. It's like, why is everything still fucking rumbling? I shut off my stereo and I just hear that, and I'm like, Motherfucker, that's the Windsor Hum, holy shit. So I went out and grabbed a camera, you know, this is before I had, you know, the A7S and, you know, low light king of the universe, uh, and walked around my driveway, just kind of getting this, you can just hear this, this super low end warble. If you've got a subwoofer system, um, you can, you can hear it in the video. And I was just, it just kind of blew my mind. It was just like the weather must have been just right that night or something like that. But yes, we actually did get the Windsor home way the fuck out here, but that is incredibly rare. It more, more or less happens in the west end of Windsor and close proximity to Zug Island. 
Hey, Glenn, have you considered watching Detroit Metal City? Why, yes. Yes, I have watched it, and it was phenomenal. Absolutely loved it. Even watched the live-action movie with Gene Simmons. Oh. <laughs> wow, that was fucking embarrassing for him. But anyway, yeah, uh, Detroit Metal City was fucking awesome. Loved it. Um, if you guys have any more anime suggestions, yeah, leave them in the comments below as well. Fucking always love hearing uh, your ideas for stuff to check out. One Punch Man is definitely next on my list to check out. I think I'm going through Trinity 7 right now. I'm just kind of slogging my way through that. Anyway, that's it for this week, guys. Thank you so much for, uh, for checking it out. And uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs>